We're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 15, verses 37 to 39. We read this already, but we're going to read it again, and then we'll read each verse a third time as we uh, work through those three verses. So I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles as I read verses 37 through 39 of Mark chapter 15. Uh, there aren't any slides or any PowerPoints for this sermon, no outline. So I simply ask you to listen and uh, meditate on the word of the Lord as we try to digest these uh, few verses. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 37, says this, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Let's pray together. Father, as we seek to understand more these verses from the crucifixion narrative of the gospel of Mark, I pray that your spirit would illuminate our hearts to understand more of Jesus's crucifixion and what that meant for our life, for our salvation, and for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Well, I'll readily admit that this is slightly out of season, but the first few lines of Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, uh, is appropriate for this, these three verses that we've just read. And I'll read those first few lines to you right now, where Charles Dickens says, Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon charge for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Well, like old Marley, Jesus of Nazareth, guess what, was as dead as a doornail. He took his last breath on the cross, and this is attested to by many, not the least of whom is the centurion, this Roman soldier, this Roman guard who witnessed the whole thing. In fact, we see in verse 39 that the centurion stood facing Jesus and perhaps had the best view of anyone. And therefore, he could testify to his death. Shortly after that, Pilate called upon the centurion to certify Jesus' death. And you see that in verses 44 and 45 of Mark chapter 15. So it wasn't that Jesus merely fainted or that he survived the crucifixion by some miraculous means. It wasn't that he merely appeared to die as the Muslims claim. It was that Jesus was totally and completely dead. He breathed his last. I like what the King James Version says in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and John. He gave up the ghost. He was completely dead. Now, one of the, the amazing things about the death of Jesus is that it proves and authenticates our living faith. We have a living faith, not a dead religion. And the crucifixion of Jesus Christ proves that our faith is alive because it proves that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So tonight, as we meditate on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we're going to take a look at these three verses a little bit more. And in each of these verses, we're going to see an accomplishment of the crucifixion. We're going to see in the three verses, three accomplishments that resulted when Jesus breathed his last. The first thing we see in verse 37 is that Jesus' last breath accomplished our redemption. Look again at verse 37. 
And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. He breathed his last breath. Now the first time we read of God breathing is when he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living soul in Genesis 2-7. And here we read that Jesus breathed his last breath. This was the Son of God's last breath as a pre-resurrected God-man. But of course, we know he would breathe again. In fact, we know that he breathes again because on the evening of his resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples behind closed doors. And John 20 verse 22 says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know that the Holy Spirit would descend on them 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. Of course, we also know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that God's very word is God-breathed. So the breath of God was given to man not only to make him become a living soul, but also to allow him to receive revelation from God through the scriptures. But here in Mark chapter 15, just like any other dying man, Jesus breathes his last. And yet Jesus is no ordinary man. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He is God who died on the cross. And his dying breath accomplished something. And what did it accomplish? Well, first of all, we know that it accomplished our redemption. See, this verse in Mark coincides with similar verses in Matthew, Luke, and John, which offer some clarifying details to verse 37. In Luke, we read this from Luke 23, verse 46, or yeah, verse 46. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. In Mark, we don't know what the last cry was. Mark 15, 37, we don't know what that la loud cry really was. But here in Luke, we have Jesus committing his spirit to his father's hands by calling out with a loud voice. Now, the word spirit in Luke 23 is akin to Mark's use of the word breath in Mark 15. And it simply means that Jesus expired. He breathed his last. He gave up his spirit. And when Jesus expired and breathed up his last breath, he gave over his spirit to his father. Notice his spirit wasn't taken from him. He gave it up freely. And likewise, Jesus' life was not taken from him. He gave his life willingly and deliberately. And this may be why he died surprisingly quickly. Because Later on, in a few verses later, when Pilate realizes that he's already dead, Pilate is surprised. And of course, that's when he calls in the centurion to certify that Jesus actually died. But Jesus didn't merely run out of breath. He gave his last breath to his father. John, the apostle, records the same instant, instance in his gospel with a little bit different detail in John 19, verse 30, where John, says, or where John the apostle says this, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Again, we don't know what Mark's loud cry was from Jesus. But it may have been these words, or it may have been some inward groan 
following, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, or following, it is finished. But no matter what the content of Jesus' final cry was, the fact is that Jesus could proclaim, it is finished. And he declares that redemption is done. And this is the difference between every other religion and Christianity. Because every other religion is a works-based religion. And for every other religion on earth, the mantra is, do, do, do. But for Christ, when he says, it is finished, it is done, he says, done, done, done. You remember that old Sunday school song? Done, done, D-O-N-E, done, done, done perfectly, finished, Christ cried, when on Calvary he died, so it's done, done, done. You remember that song? Maybe not. Okay, man, I, we need to get you guys uh, boned up on these old songs. Good grief. I must have grown up in a different Sunday school. But it is done, done, done. Whenever you try to do, 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 you're going down the wrong path. It's done. And when Jesus said, it is finished, he declared that the work of redemption is finished. It's accomplished. And the work of buying us back from our sinfulness is finished with Jesus' last breath on the cross. The second thing that was accomplished, and we see this in verse 38, is that Jesus' last breath opened access to God through Jesus Christ rather than through an earthly temple. Look at verse 38 with me. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. The last breath of Jesus was so powerful that it tears the thick, heavy fabric dividing uh, the holy place from the most holy place. This gigantic, thick curtain that was in the temple that divided the holy place where only the priests could go from the most holy place where only the high priest could go only once a year. It was called the Holy of Holies. Now, that curtain was torn in two, which means someone could look into that Holy of Holies. In fact, if they wanted to, they could walk into it. Now, to be sure, the only ones who really would have known this would have been the priests. But we also know from Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that a great many priests became obedient to the faith. In other words, priests themselves, after the day of Pentecost, after the preaching of the gospel, became Christians. And they could easily testify to what happened. But what we have is a more sure word of prophecy because we have it written down right here in Scripture. Some wonder if this curtain was actually just the curtain that divided the outside temple courts between the court of the women and the court of the men. And I don't think that's the case. I think primarily because merely opening up the temple courts to one another in a more public way would not have nearly have been as significant theologically and redemptively. I think the true significance of this torn curtain is that the well-guarded Holy of Holies, that 30 foot by 30 foot by 30 foot cube that only one person in the entire world could get into and one day a year, that well-guarded room that was supposed to contain the Ark of the Covenant, that room was now unveiled. And this place that in the earthly realm signified 
access to God by way of the Day of Atonement was opened up for anyone. Now think about that for a bit. Uh, for a bit. Notice it was torn in two from top to bottom. No human being could have done that. It was thick. It was multi-layered. Uh, it was too tall for any mere human being to have been able to tear it from top to bottom. Plus, it would have been too thick for any human hand to tear. Remember when they used to have the old phone books that big burly guys would try to break or try to rip? That was the case with this curtain. It was thick. It was not just some drape that you put into, the, into your living room. There was a thick, multi-layer curtain. And it could not have been uh, ripped by any human hand. There must have been something supernatural here. But secondly, think about this. Mark says it was torn. It's the Greek word schizo. We get our word scissors from that word. And the word schism, right? Divide. It was schismed. It was torn. The only other place that Mark uses that word is in the beginning of his gospel at Jesus' baptism. And this is what Mark says at the beginning of the gospel as Jesus is baptized. In Mark chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn, schizo, torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And I think this is significant in the fact that at the beginning of his earthly ministry, the heavens are torn open. And at the end of his earthly ministry, the curtain of the temple is torn in two. The heavens, we can't see up into the heavens where God is, and yet God schisms the heavens. And the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. We can't see into the Holy of Holies, but the Holy of Holies, the, the curtain is schismed. And we can see into the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews explains the significance because he reminds us that Jesus entered the holy places to make a more perfect atonement for our sins. Now, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He was neither a Levite nor, more specifically, a descendant of Aaron. And only the descendants of Aaron could be priests. So only the descendants of Aaron could walk into the holy place, much less the holy of holies. So Jesus had no earthly right to enter the temple. He was not the high priest. He was not a Levite. He was not a descendant of Aaron. In fact, the current high priest in Jesus' day had just sentenced him to death. But more than this, Jesus was cursed because he was hanging on a tree. And the law said, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. You can see Paul reiterating that in Galatians 3.13. So not only did Jesus have the earthly right through lineage to enter into the holy places, he had no right because of his curse and his uncleanness to enter into the holy of holies. But as the son of God, as the perfect sacrifice for sin, he had every right to enter into a more perfect tabernacle and offer himself as the sufficient atonement for sin. Tearing open the, the heavens and going into not just the holy place, but the holy of holies. Listen to what Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Holy places place and the holy of holies 
not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, what? Thus securing an eternal redemption. Jesus' last breath cut that curtain in two so that he can go through the holy place and the holiest of holies and secure for us our eternal redemption. But not only does Jesus secure our eternal redemption, eternal, uh, re, our eternal redemption, he also grants us access to God who dwells in the holy of holies. Because if you look just a chapter later in Hebrews chapter 10, he says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We're not priests in, in the Levitical sense, but we're priests of God. Why? Because Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he is a, a, a better priest a more perfect priest, a priest who did not need to cleanse himself from sin, but who, through his own blood, tore that veil, tore that curtain, opened the door for himself to go into the holiest of holies, and allows us now to go into the holies of ho holy of holies. Access to God directly. We no longer need an earthly mediator, an earthly intercessor, to go into, to have access to God, we no longer need a sinful and earthly high priest. We have Jesus forever and ever, and we have access. We can be bold to go into the house, the house of the Lord, the Holy of Holies. And Jesus accomplished that himself through his death on the cross. And when that curtain was torn in two, it signaled the death of an old system where the physical temple was the locus of, the, of God's atonement for the Israelites. And the signaling of the brand new, a new system, a new and living way through Jesus' own blood, through a cross, which is the new altar, which is a new Ark of the Covenant, which is the new mercy seat, that altar of atonement, so that at the cross, the Gentiles, this centurion himself, the unqualified, those who are women and those who are not Levites, in fact, the unclean, this Joseph of Arimathea, who was a ruler of the temple, who was on the ruling council, but because he touched the body of Jesus, he was unclean. They could come and receive forgiveness of sins. They can come and receive freedom from the slavery of sin. Paul talks about this in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Have you received that redemption? We have access because Jesus breathed his last. And he breathed his last on a cross-shaped altar. And if we believe in him, we have life and redemption through that death. Well, lastly, Jesus' death, Jesus' last breath authenticated his deity. We see that in verse 39. The death of Jesus did not disprove his deity. It didn't disprove that he was God. The crucifixion proves that Jesus is indeed God. In fact, the Son of God. To be the Son of God is to be God himself because he has all the authority of his Father and is the very nature of his Father. Look at verse 39 one more time. And when the centurion who stood facing him 
saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Notice what the centurion sees. See, he has seen many men die by Roman crucifixion. But there's something different about the way Jesus died. Something different about that man who took his last breath. Something strangely unique above all those countless other criminals that the centurion had seen die on crosses. Because Jesus' breathing his last was so powerful that itself became a revelation to this Gentile soldier. So that this soldier could state, according to Mark, truly this man was the Son of God. Now, to be sure, the centurion knows nothing of Jesus' coming resurrection. So at this stage in God's revelation to this centurion, Jesus is the Son of God expired. He doesn't know that three days later Jesus is going to rise. So he knows that he's dead. So in his mind, he was the Son of God. But it wouldn't be more than a couple days later that even this centurion would perhaps learn that not only is Jesus the Son of God expired, he's also the Son of God raised. And by confessing the deity of Christ, this centurion follows in a very impressive train of those who confess that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Of course, we saw in Mark chapter 1, verse 10 at Jesus' baptism that God the Father himself confesses Jesus as his Son. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. But did you know that Jesus himself confessed his own deity? And when he was questioned by the high priest if he was the Son of the Blessed or the Son of God, Jesus, of course, says, yes, yes, I am. Because he causes the high priest to just rend his garments as a sign of blasphemy. Also in Mark, Mark chapter 14. But he, that is Jesus, remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? Now, in case you're, look, you're thinking, he tore his garments. Sorry, that's not the same word that was used at the beginning of Mark and at the end of Mark. But he tore those garments as a sign of blasphemy. And from that moment on, they needed no further false witnesses. They had all the evidence they needed to convict Jesus of sin. But Jesus proclaimed that he was indeed the Son of God. The Apostle Peter, also in Mark, confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Matthew, I should say. Uh, and that in that great revelation from the Father in Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And of course, Mark himself in this gospel declares Jesus to be the Son of God in the very first verse of this gospel, where Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So this centurion is in very good company. And back here in verse 39 of Mark 15, how is it possible that this uneducated Gentile Roman soldier with no religious training in Judaism, uh, no training in the sacred scriptures, no pretensions for holiness, no knowledge of Jesus of Nazareth, other than how, what he has seen of him on the cross, how is it possible that this Roman soldier should confess the sonship and deity of Jesus Christ. It's because when he saw that in this way he breathed his last, 
he said, truly, this man was the son of God. It's not only the death of Jesus that's important, but it's in the way that Jesus died that authenticates his deity. Because he gave up his last breath. He died on purpose. If Herod had slain baby Jesus back in Matthew chapter 2, that would not have had the saving significance as Jesus dying on a cross. Because in this way he died. He gave up his last breath. And it authenticates his deity. And because the cross is the altar on which the atoning sacrifice is made, and because Jesus died willingly and deliberately, and because his life was not taken from him, he gave it freely. And in this way, the Son of God died. We have redemption, we have access, and we have assurance that Jesus is who he said he is. He is who God the Father said he is. He is who Peter and Mark himself said he is. And he is who this centurion said he is. And therefore, we have assurance to know that this is the truth. Jesus died on a cross to save you and me. Now the cross is precious to, to us. We, we sung about that early on this evening. But the cross is not our Savior. Jesus is. The cross is like the law. It doesn't save us, but it is the instrument that God uses to bring about the atoning death of his Son. And through that death, we have access to the Father. And such is the case with this crucifixion narrative. Jesus breathes his last breath on the cross. And through that last breath, redemption is secured. And access to God is granted. And Christ's deity is authenticated. And by breathing his last breath on the cross, Jesus indeed paid it all. The question is, do you believe this? Consider this. Think about this. And let's pray about this.